All right, good afternoon and welcome. I am Valerie Weber and I serve as the Community Impact Director here in Akron, Canton and Youngstown with the American Heart Association. Today I will be your host and moderator and we're looking forward to a robust community conversation today around heart disease and COVID-19. Today we're going to discuss how COVID-19 impacts the heart and the body as a whole, what COVID-19 may do to the heart even after recovery, how to access care and telehealth services, and tips and strategies for wellness from the American Heart Association and SUMA Health. As we begin our conversation today, please feel free to use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to ask questions. We are going to have an open Q&A at the end of today's conversation for about the last 15 minutes. But if any questions come up um, that you're thinking about during our conversation, please feel free to enter those into the chat um, as we're speaking here today. So I'm going to introduce our panel of experts and I'm really, really pleased um, to have everyone uh, join us today. And we wanna take a moment to thank each of our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to bring their expertise to, the, to today's community conversation. So I'm happy to introduce Dr. Dunn. He is Interventional Cardiologist Chief at SUMA Health. Dr. Brian Bauman, he is Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine and a Medical Director of Respiratory Care and Pulmonary Service at SUMA Health. Dr. Varian, Advanced Heart Failure Cardiology at SUMA Health. And Tracy Benke, Executive Director here at the American Heart Association. We also have another special guest joining us today um, to share her story, and we're going to introduce her in just a few minutes here. This community conversation is powered by local support from SUMA Health. Thank you so much. All right, so we are going to go ahead and jump right into uh, our conversation here today, and I'd like to introduce Carolyn Collins, and she is going to share her story uh, with us. Carolyn, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi, thank you all for letting me jump on here. I'm Caroline Collins. I, as of two months ago, was a news anchor, the weekend news anchor and reporter at WFMJ in Youngstown, Ohio. And I recently moved to sunny and warm California, uh, where I am a morning news anchor now. So I'm happy that I could join you guys. But in the midst of, of everything uh, going on and all the life changes, I've been battling what is called pericarditis caused by COVID. It was a COVID related problem. In August, I contracted COVID-19. I developed really, really bad chest pains in my left side. And I'm a journalist and I'm a healthy young adult. So I just thought nothing of it. And then I told my mom and some family members who work in the healthcare field and they said, get to the hospital. So um, I didn't feel well. I had all the COVID symptoms and then this chest pain on my left side going on. So at that point, I went to Sharon Regional Hospital they did blood work. They found a high level of troponin in my blood work. And they thought that that was very concerning for my age. This is at the beginning of August, whenever this research with the athletes and COVID and what it can do to your heart still wasn't very um, out there yet. It was just starting to come out. So I was admitted to Sharon Regional Hospital for about 20 full for over 24 hours where they ran blood tests and they determined that I needed a cardiac MRI. I received the cardiac MRI maybe like a week later. Um, Dr. Miklich and Dr. Miklich at Sharon Regional Father Son Team, um, they were great to work with. They actually showed me all of the swelling and inflammation that was surrounding my heart. My heart lining was all swelled up. It was very painful. Um, they said this was very concerning because it could turn into something worse called myocarditis. And that's the actual swelling of the heart. And basically, I guess what they're finding, of course, the experts joining us here today can speak more on this. But what I'm learning that they're finding is that COVID is really stressing out the heart in healthy young adults. And it, it was so crazy. So anyway, since then, I've been on some like anti-inflammatory medication and some other stuff that they put me on. I personally didn't want to be on a steroid, um, I guess that maybe would have, would have helped more. But anyway, it's been six months now and I'm still uh, in pain every single day. It kind of feels like somebody is like pushing their fist like through my chest. Um, I can't work out still 
I'm a big golfer and golfing really irritates my, my chest now. So what they're telling me is that this type of pericarditis or even myocarditis can actually take up to a year to, to heal. And you can't, you know, raise your heart rate because it would irritate your heart. And, and then the problem wouldn't get better. They also told me that it would get worse or feel like it was getting worse before it got better. And as of a couple of weeks ago, I was almost in tears just with the pain being so bad. Um, actually sitting like I'm sitting now in my car really irritates it. Sitting on an airplane is horrible and driving across the country when I moved was like the worst thing ever. It just, it's just very painful. Um, so I am restricted on what I can do. The problem could have been worse. Again, it could have been myocarditis. Luckily mine is just pericarditis. Um, but I never, you know, I felt a lot more sick um, prior to COVID when I came down with maybe the flu or a cold, whatever it was. There were plenty of times in my life that I felt worse than when I had COVID. Now, don't get me wrong. COVID was miserable and horrible, but it was just crazy to me that this, this caused this inflammation and my body reacted the way that it did. In the news over the last couple of months, we have seen athletes um, have a similar problem to what I'm experiencing. There was a Red Sox pitcher that ended up having myocarditis as um, an effect from COVID. And there was a Florida Gators basketball player that collapsed on the floor and mid game. And, and that may have been a cause of something like this. He did have COVID. Um, so it's a serious problem. It's something I think that a lot of young people don't realize and don't think about um, when they think about COVID. And I just still can't believe that six months later, I'm still dealing with this. I have a follow-up appointment coming up back at home with Sharon Regional um, next month. So hopefully, I don't know what they'll tell me. If I'm still in pain, I'm sure I have to keep resting, but it's been an adjustment. <laughs> Carolyn, thank you so much for sharing your story and helping uh, raise awareness about this. And we're going to turn it over now to the doctors. Um, we have a few questions that we're going to ask them, but we will want to get into a little bit about uh, Carolyn's story and um, just really touching on, you know, how common is this? Um, you know, we we realize that um, some of these cases are are um, maybe a little bit more rare, especially with the myocarditis, but um, the pericarditis, we like to touch on that as well. So we're going to start with... Uh, oh, yeah. a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Say thank you to the American Heart Association for all the work that you guys do and like the experts that you put forward. This is so important and it's awesome that you guys are raising this awareness. So thank you for letting me share my story. I got to share it on the news back when I worked at home. So it's good that it's still in the still in the front minds of people. Absolutely. Thank you so much again, Carolyn. We appreciate you taking the time to share your story. So we're gonna turn it over now to Dr. Bowman. Can you explain how COVID may affect the body and the systems that it may impact? Sure, yeah, and I thank you again for having me here today. It's, it's great to be able to spread some awareness about COVID and, and help people understand this, this very complex disease. And, and thank you for, to Carolyn for sharing your story as well. You know, it's, it's good for people to hear from kind of seemingly normal, healthy people about what COVID can really do to you. So, um, you know, COVID is really, it can be a systemic disease and it, and it really is. It's not really just, just a bronchitis or pneumonia. It really is, affects the body as a whole. And a lot of this is related to the inflammation that the body produces as a result of the virus. And a lot of the, the very severe damage that occurs in the lungs and other parts of the body is related to that inflammation. And that's why steroids are, are used to treat the, the, you know, the side effects or consequences of COVID. Um, you know, it, it can involve uh, the, the lungs or cause pneumonia. It frequently causes blood clots in the body. And that's one of the, the damaging things that can occur. And those can occur in various parts of the body, including the heart, lungs, and, and other organs. Um, it can cause... An, brain injury as well. And some of that is related to uh, strokes or blood clots in the brain. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a good start, I think. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Bowman. 
And we're going to turn it over now to Dr. Dunn. So Dr. Dunn, when we think about the impacts COVID can have on the heart, what are you and your team looking out for? Well, thanks. And again, thanks to Carolyn for, for sharing that story. Um, uh, you know, when it comes to the heart, uh, like Dr. Bauman said, you know, COVID can attack many different organ systems in the body and the heart certainly is one of them. And inflammation uh, seems to be kind of at the center in some way, shape or form uh, of all that. So the, the condition that Carolyn described, pericarditis and also myocarditis, you know, pericarditis is inflammation of the lining of the heart or, or the sac that the heart sits in. And myocarditis is inflammation of the actual heart muscle itself. And both of them are types of inflammation triggered either by the COVID virus in the cells themselves or triggered by the, um, the virus causing systemic inflammation throughout the body that then has an effect on the heart. So as far as symptoms, I think Carolyn did a great job describing some of the symptoms we see. You know, uh, it, it, a lot of it depends on what the, uh, what the effect on the heart is. If you're looking at things like pericarditis, you're going to get kind of this sharp, pleuritic pain in your chest. You take a deep breath in, it hurts. You lean forward, it might get better. You lean back, it might get worse. Um, uh, and that pain, can, that pain can be very uncomfortable, as Carolyn described, and it can persist. Uh, and you know, kind of anti-inflammatory treatments are really um, standard therapy for that. Myocarditis uh, can have similar symptoms, but it can also irritate the heart muscle, which can cause, uh, you know, almost worse effects. It can cause uh, heart rhythm issues. So people come in complaining of palpitations, their heart fluttering in their chest. That's something we have to be very aware of because then we have to look, at, does this patient have, um, you know, myocarditis because, uh, Myocarditis can be relatively benign in certain settings, but it can also cause catastrophic consequences, especially if the person doesn't know they have it. You know, patients with myocarditis can go into abnormal arrhythmias, some of which can potentially be fatal, especially if you stress out the heart. So patients who have really raging myocarditis and a lot of inflammation of their heart muscle, especially athletes, we tell them, you know, cut out any significant activity for a certain period of time, sometimes several months to prevent any kind of um, pushing of the heart and to prevent any kind of those uh, abnormal arrhythmias. So palpitations, chest pain, um, shortness of breath, uh, you know, pericarditis and myocarditis can cause, like, like Carolyn said, it, swelling and edema in the heart that they saw in her MRI. Now pericarditis in particular can cause irritation and swelling to the point that it can build up fluid around the heart and get fluid inside the heart sac itself and that heart sac is pretty stiff. And so if you build up fluid inside of there, uh, even over a short period of time, that can cause compression of the heart and not allow the heart to expand and pump blood where it needs to go. And it can cause what's called cardiac tamponade. And it can, it can be fatal. It can cause the patient's blood pressure to, to slowly drop, or it can cause the patient's right ventricle to precipitously collapse and not allow the blood to, to, to pump blood or the heart to pump blood to the body. So there are, uh, you know, shortness of breath certainly is one of the things we look for. Rising heart rate, you know, getting your heart rate up is something we look for. Um, and then any kind of lightheadedness, passing out spells, those are all warning signs that potentially COVID has affected the heart, especially in patients that we know have the virus. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. Dr. Varian, uh, when an individual shows signs of heart-related issues due to COVID, what types of symptoms uh, might they experience? Other than maybe some of the symptoms that Dr. Dunn has already uh, touched on. Well, thank you very much, Valerie. So, um, uh, well, Dr. Dunn covered most of it, um, but uh, I would say that the, um, uh, you know, the main symptoms that someone's going to have from a heart perspective, if there's actually heart involvement, will be shortness of breath with exertion or the chest pain uh, that was described, uh, what we call pleuritic chest pain, where uh, it worsens with a deep breath. Um, it uh, can worsen when you lay back, that kind of thing. So um, these are the kinds of symptoms that, that one might look out for. Now, sometimes it's, it's a little tricky to tell the difference between COVID that's causing a problem with the heart and COVID that is sort of still residual, residually causing issues with the uh, lungs. And so um, sometimes what we have to do is that we'll uh, see a patient um, 
examine them really closely, get a good sense of their, uh, uh, their symptoms, uh, get a good uh, physical exam and uh, an EKG, and then in some cases get an echocardiogram. And if the echo um, is normal, sometimes people just take a long time to recover from this and it's not really heart involvement. So it just sort of depends on the individual situation. Thank you, Dr. Varian. So this will be a good follow-up uh, to that, Dr. Dunn. What do we know about heart-related symptoms which are experienced even after a person has recovered from COVID? So Dr. Varian kind of touched on, it can be a little bit difficult to decipher between some of these symptoms. Um, is there anything you could add to that um, to help folks understand a little bit better? Sure, you know, this is interesting because Obviously, we're, we're in the early stages of, of understanding this disease and all the effects it has on the body. And we're starting to see patients who not only have acute symptoms, but they start to have symptoms that persist uh, over several weeks and several months. And you, know, you see in the news, they're calling these the COVID long haulers. Um, and some of their symptoms are a little bit um, uh, poorly defined, a little bit nebulous. Uh, you know, they, they might come in saying things like, you know, I just feel kind of foggy still. I, I still feel um, a little bit of shortness of breath. I still feel fatigued. Uh, and it's difficult because obviously there are a lot of different disease processes uh, that can cause fatigue, shortness of breath, kind of just a, a feeling of malaise. Uh, and so it's hard to know what, what, is, what to blame on their previous COVID exposure and, and what to blame on some other disease process we need to look for. Um, so in general, I would say, you know, if a patient has had known COVID, if you're looking specifically at cardiac issues, um, you know, I would look for things like Carolyn has persistent chest pain. Um, I would look for persistent fatigue. You know, if a patient just says, gosh, I just, I just can't uh, get my energy level up anymore. And I, I don't, I don't know what's wrong. I just don't feel right. You know, that might push us to, to start um, looking for other cardiac effects. Like maybe the patient's in an abnormal heart rhythm now. And they don't realize it. They don't have palpitations, but their heart's not pumping as well as it could because they're in something like atrial fibrillation or or some other heart rhythm that's abnormal that we need to define and address. Uh, it, you know, it could be that they're developing that fluid around the heart. And it's not quite at a catastrophic stage yet, but they're still feeling signs and symptoms of it. So that's something we need to look for with an echocardiogram. So I think even if a patient gets out of the acute phase of COVID, uh, we still need to keep in mind that some of their symptoms may be, especially if they come in with these kind of these vague symptoms may be somehow related to their heart and be very vigilant to look for anything that potentially could be something impending, uh, something catastrophic down the road. Thanks so much, Dr. Dunn. And Dr. Bowman, many people associate COVID with just lung-related issues, and we really touched quite a bit on um, heart-related issues around COVID. Can you touch on that mis the misconception that folks uh, often think it's just lung-related uh, issues and any other um, symptoms that might uh, surface? Sure, and uh, you know, Dr. Dunn and, and Varian did a great job of kind of summary summarizing the, the heart-related issues and some of those symptoms. And and like was mentioned, it is it is difficult sometimes to tease out what what organ is affected by COVID because the symptoms can can really cross over those different organs. So, um, you know, shortness of breath is, is certainly one of the, the most common symptoms. And, you know, that can be because of direct injury to the lungs. It can also be the injury or dysfunction of the heart. Uh, but as I mentioned before, blood clots are a serious uh, problem with COVID. And we see uh, much higher frequency of, of blood clots, whether severe or less severe, um, and those occur both in the, the larger veins in the body and, and in arteries as well. And so, you know, that can be a, a heart attack, you know, lead, leading to a blood clot in, in coronary arteries. But frequently we see uh, what we call venous thromboembolism or blood clots in the legs or even arms or pelvis that then can travel to the lungs. And that, that can cause, you know, that's then a pulmonary embolism. And those, those can be very life-threatening. It causes you know, fast heart rate. It can cause low blood pressure, low oxygen levels, shortness of breath. And that, that happens for a significant period of time uh, immediately during the COVID infection and thereafter as well. So we actually, in the hospital, we watch very closely for, for signs of blood clots. We do some blood, blood evaluation, blood work on people. We, we screen with ultrasounds of their legs 
and we have a very low threshold to really look for blood clots in the lungs. Um, we also tend to give people prophylactic medicine to prevent blood clots, even some people who are at home, if they have severe enough COVID when they're at home, we have given people um, prophylactic medicine for, for blood clots in that scenario. But definitely if you're in the hospital, we, we do that. Um, and then, you know, obviously treat, treat those blood clots with blood thinners if need be. Um, you know, I think some of the more unusual things that we're seeing, and, and I say unusual, they're not really that unusual. They're actually, you know, relatively common symptoms, but we don't fully understand why they occur. You know, there's this, there's a lot of neurologic impact of, of COVID, and that can be anywhere from just vague headaches and some difficulty concentrating um, or, or kind of slowed cognition. Uh, and that happens in people who don't even end up in the hospital. Uh, and then we see some things that are very catastrophic, uh, you know, paralysis type syndromes, very similar to what we saw with like West Nile virus, where basically the lining of the nerve cells gets, gets damaged by the immune response and people can get paralysis, uh, what we call encephalitis, which is, which is almost, it's an infection almost directly of the brain and people get severe cognitive dysfunction. They can become completely unconscious. And um, we certainly see a lot of those more mild cases in people who have COVID and then present later with just saying, I, I can't concentrate anymore. I can't think as well as I used to. I have these headaches. And you know, the, we don't know necessarily what to do about that right now. And then some of the other things are, are psychologic and, that, and they're difficult to differentiate sometimes from the direct you know, brain or neurologic injury. Um, but especially for somebody who goes through a severe COVID, um, it can produce really a post-traumatic stress disorder. The, the people are oftentimes on ventilators in the ICU for a long period of time, hospitalized, isolated from their, their family and friends. They can't see anybody because of the COVID isolation. And even if you're at home, you know, in quarantine for 14 days, not being able to physically see or touch anybody can certainly be difficult. So, you know, the, we can't underestimate really the psychologic impact of COVID on people as well. And then, you know, there, there's other blood clots that can occur in, in the digits. So we see people kind of losing fingers and toes because they get clots in their, in their extremities. Um, I'm trying to think what else we see. Um, I, th I think that that covers kind of the, the majority of the, of the main consequences of COVID, but it's, it's, very, it's very diverse and, you know, really understanding all of this is important. Uh, and if it temporarily correlates to when you got a COVID infection, it probably is somehow related to the infection or the immune response to the infection. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. Um, and we have a few follow-up questions to that. Um, so I think I'll touch on that right now. So how often are you seeing some of these really severe um, issues such as like the blood clots um, with, with some of your COVID patients? Yeah, so the, I mean, Dr. Dunn can probably comment too because he treats some of these blood clots in a special way. But, you know, the incidence of even in unexplained blood clots is, is much, much higher. And talking to some of our friends across the country too, this is not unique to Akron. You know, we're seeing a much higher incidence of what we call massive or submassive pulmonary embolism where they get these catastrophic blood clots. And oftentimes when you take somebody's history, you'll find out that they had this kind of vague viral illness, you know, two weeks ago. And they may not have even known that they had COVID. So the, the incidence of blood clots in particular is far higher uh, than it is in normal hospitalized patients or even than we normally see in the hospital, you know, uh, for blood clots in general. Got it. And then, you know, as far as uh, touching on pericarditis, is this something you're seeing uh, quite a bit? Is this, is this been relatively common? Um, any comment on that from any of the panelists? So, you know, I, I, I've certainly seen pericarditis a number of times. Um, it's not as common as a lot of the other conditions, but we see, we, see per, we see this inflammation of the organ linings. And so oftentimes they have a combination of pericarditis or inflammation around the sac of the lung or the heart along with inflammation around the sac of the lung. 
And so we see those together a lot of times. And sometimes that's the only real symptom that they have. And it's so we see it. It's it's not one of the most common etiologies, but you know, I, it may be I may see different people than the heart doctors. Great, got it. Now I want to go back over to uh, Dr. Varian. So if someone experiences some of these symptoms either pre or post COVID, how can they access care and or telehealth services? How can they get help? Sure. So. Um, well, first of all, I would say that, uh, you know, you can always, uh, call your primary care physician, or if you have a cardiologist or a, or a pulmonologist, uh, you can call their office and, and see, uh, if, if an appointment is available, uh, telemedicine appointment, if that's available. But I think what the one thing I want, want to really stress to everybody is, is that it's safe to go to your doctor. Uh, one of the things that we've seen happen a lot in the past year is patients get sick at home and they're afraid to come in. And that can be a lot more dangerous sometimes than even the complications of the disease. So, uh, you know, the, the, the doctor's offices are safe. Everybody's wearing masks. Everyone washes their hands a lot. Um, and many of the conditions we've talked about, it, uh, and I'll say especially with regards to the to the heart require an in-person visit in order to determine what's going on. And so while everybody, including myself um, and uh, most of the physicians that are practicing today are very used to doing telemedicine visits, it isn't quite the same as seeing somebody in person. So if you really are sick, uh, I would encourage you to be seen in person. If you're, uh, you know, you're not sure, you just have questions, then you know, a telemedicine visit is probably okay. Um, I'll make one quick comment about pericarditis. Uh, you know, viral illnesses uh, cause pericarditis, and, and we see this um, reasonably frequently, I, I would say, uh, in non-COVID eras. And I would say that, that in today's era with COVID, I would say that there's been a small uptick in the amount of pericarditis that we see, but not very significant. So I think that the chances of getting a, a bad case of pericarditis is certainly there, as it is with every other virus. Um, but it's not very high. Um, but if you if it is a problem that that you end up getting, uh, it is something that definitely needs um, definitely needs treatment sometimes uh, in the in in the longer run more than just the short. Thank you, Dr. Varian. And uh, the next question, I think uh, Dr. Bowman could probably touch on this. We understand Suma is starting a post-COVID clinic. Um, can you touch on that? Sure. So yeah, we are, you know, we were kind of approached by the community as a whole to kind of deal with patients who have had COVID, been in the hospital, or just been sick with COVID and then have some of these persistent symptoms. So, you know, already with the cohort of patients that we've had hospitalized at, at uh, SUMA, we, we've been following up on those with per persistent lung dysfunction. So the people requiring oxygen or persistent shortness of breath, most of those patients do follow up in our, in our pulmonary offices. But we've identified, like, like was mentioned previously, that there's a cohort of patients who really has this more complex uh, symptomatology, and they have you know, a variety of organs or symptoms that could be affected by their COVID infection. And so we've arranged a, a multidisciplinary type of uh, clinic, and, and it's not to say that you will come in and see 10 doctors all at once, but what we do is when we, we evaluate in our, in our pulmonary offices the, the constellation of symptoms and then determine whether additional testing or evaluation is needed with one of our other specialists. And, you know, the other thing that I think is important that was mentioned is that we don't know a lot about this disease, and so we've intentionally limited the the group of doctors dealing with this so that our doctors really become experts in the, in the area of COVID because the only way to know about this is to see lots and lots of patients with it because they're, you can't really look up in a, in a textbook you know, what to expect, you have to experience that. And so, so we've, we've identified specialists in a variety of, of specialties including cardiology, uh, neurology, our psychologists and psychiatrists are involved, uh, vascular surgeons for some of those complications, and then our, our pulmonologists. And we've also um, uh, engaged our rehab specialists. So we have specific physical therapy programs for people that may have been kind of debilitated by COVID. 
and also a cardiopulmonary rehab program for people with persistent shortness of breath or, or cardiac dysfunction after COVID infection. So we, we really, we kind of triage people. We see them initially in the, in the pulmonary office and then, and then we have expedited appointments. So our other doctors will then see that patient within one week of the initial visit so they can get evaluated promptly and potentially by multiple doctors if needed. Excellent, thank you so much. And is there uh, a resource or a phone number available uh, that folks could call in um, for that post-COVID clinic at SUMA? Yeah, so the, the phone number is, is 330-319-9700. And that, th this cl clinic is in the works, so we're, we're, we're in the process of organizing it. So that, those are our, our pulmonary offices that are open and aware of this process. There will be a website which should be up within uh, probably a couple of days, which is www.sumahealth.org slash coronavirus slash post care. I, I did drop those resources into the chat and we'll make sure that we provide those uh, via an email recap to everyone that attended today. And I, and I, there is one, there is, sorry to cut you off. There is one other resource I, I wanted to mention, and we have a, another kind of more specialized area for COVID too, which is for athletes. And so uh, one of our cardiologists, Dr. Schaub, and then our sports medicine doctors have been really working well with a number of the, the athletic teams in the area for colleges and high schools, and also um, for, for any kind of athlete who's interested in returning to sports. And, and I think that's particularly important as we mentioned that myocarditis and the you know, athlete who had the you know, arrhythmia on the basketball court. And so there's a lot of questions about when can I return to sports? And we have a separate um, number for that, uh, which is directed to our sports medicine people. And that's 330-835-5533. Excellent. Thank you so much. I did drop that into the chat as well. Um, very helpful. Uh, so I want to remind everyone, um, we are going to be going into open Q&A soon. If you have any questions, please enter those into the chat. Uh, and we do have, uh, it looks like a list that's already starting here. So next I'm going to turn it over to Tracy. And Tracy, um, what is the American Heart Association doing to address COVID and other resources that, that may be available to the community? Absolutely. Thanks, Valen today to, to Caroline and to Suma Health for powering this today. It's just, it's incredible to have such um, amazing partners and friends of heart um, that we get to work with on a daily basis. So just thank you all so much for being here today. Um, you know, so the AHA has really been on the forefront when it comes to COVID and um, what we've been able to accomplish. So as you'll see um, on the screen as I'm talking to some of the things that, you know, we are really trying to continue and are continuing our work that we do every day. Um, you know, when, when COVID first struck um, almost a year ago and it became uh, the topic of every conversation that I feel like we're all a part of, um, we were able to fund a special $2.5 million fund um, for a rapid research, um, which is just fantastic to then investigate the specific cardio implications of corona, of the coronavirus, um, and investing in some short-term projects that could turn around results quickly. So we were really fortunate to be in that kind of position to do that. Um, in addition, we have launched the Bernard J. Tyson Impact Fund, which is a national fund um, with a local investment focus, supporting and investing in evidence-based, locally-led solutions that are really breaking down the social and economic barriers to health equity. Um, another thing we're doing is working very dil diligently to provide reliable science-based information for um, you know, the approximate 120 million people in the United States that are that currently have one or more cardiovascular conditions, and you already may be at that higher risk um, for COVID-19, COVID-19 complications, as well as those who live historically um, in excluded com communities that are really being hit hard by COVID-19. Um, you know, our, our local team is really trying to expand our efforts and meeting people where they are, you know, hosting conversations such as these um, where we're really hopeful we're reaching multiple people um, because we can't be in a gathering situation to share our mission and our message and this very, very important information 
um, and also on our social media accounts, you know, so trying to have that relevant science based information out to the community um, from a trusted organization um, in our communities. So, you know, really, we're trying to support our healthcare providers, our frontline workers, and scientific researchers, um, including our own professional members who are out there fighting on the front line. So, um, you know, I've, I saw in the participants just so many of our frontline um, workers, the docs that are with us today on the panels, and just thank you all for everything that you've been doing over the last year um, and beyond of just keeping us safe and protecting the communities um, from that end. Um, you know, and really supporting community based efforts to really end health disparities, um, you know, past the the COVID pandemic passed everything um, as we're seeing heart disease is still so vital in our communities. Um, it's still hitting our underserved and at risk population um, harder than ever. And really just trying to work with local organizations and, and you know, communities trying to help bridge that gap um, so that we are making um, access to care, to food, to um, physical activity, all of those things just more accessible and removing that boundary for everybody. Um, you know, again, just thank you all so much for being here for the amazing conversation and questions. And um, I feel every time I listen to one of these, I feel so much more informed and that I can go out and continue to talk about what's happening in our communities and just from the great support of our um, our local companies and, and Summa Health. So thank you so much, everybody. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tracy. So what we're going to do now is we are going to go into open Q&A and I'm going to start at the top here. Um, so this portion is going to be open to all panelists to answer. And the first question we have is, uh, can this condition, pericarditis, be detected with a chest x-ray? Any of the panelists? Yeah, I can answer that. It, uh, the answer is usually not. Uh, there are situations where if the pericarditis has triggered enough fluid to build up around the heart that the heart starts to swell. We can sometimes see that on a chest x-ray, but in general, no, you know, you, you can't, it, it's hard to visualize pericarditis. You, you often visualize the effects of it. So um, if you, if you did an echocardiogram, you could sometimes see a layer of fluid around the heart that we presume was triggered by pericarditis, but typically it's a clinical diagnosis where you, you uh, look at the patient's symptoms, and possibly some lab measurements, you know, increased inflammatory markers, possibly some irritation of the heart muscle. Uh, like Carolyn said, she had that troponin level is a sign that you're having a little bit of heart damage. Um, and so, you know, those are kind of the general things we look for, but it's primarily a, a clinical diagnosis. And if you were to do a cardiac MRI, you'd be able to see uh, pericarditis uh, more clearly. Uh, we don't do that routinely on patients if we feel our clinical diagnosis is good. Uh, and then probably the easiest way to see it is if with an EKG, uh, which is an electrocardiogram, that's often done in the ER for patients that have chest pain almost routinely uh, for every patient with chest pain. And it, it does show, at least in a lot of cases, it shows kind of a, a telltale sign where all the, the little squiggly lines in the EKG show a very specific marker that we look for that suggests pericarditis. And so we kind of put the whole picture together. But chest x-ray, no, we often cannot see it with chest x-ray. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. Uh, next question, for patients with a history of pericard pericarditis, is contracting COVID a dangerous situation? Any of the panelists? I can take that one. So uh, patients that uh, have a history of viral pericarditis in the past, for whatever reason, seem to be more um, prone to getting it again. Uh, to say whether it or not it's dangerous, I think that's a little bit difficult to say. I think that uh, the danger in getting uh, coronavirus infection uh, is more related to other aspects of your health rather than a history of pericarditis. Um, examples might be um, obesity, um, age, of course, diabetes, prior lung disease, that kind of thing, are all things that can make it uh, getting coronavirus potentially more, more um, lethal. Um, but I do think that even though the science is not clear on this, I think the, the chances of getting a recurrent pericarditis, if you've had it in the past, is probably higher. Thank you very much, Dr. Varian. Okay, our next question, are uh, pericarditis or myocarditis carditis complications more common in younger COVID patients than the elderly?
Any comments on that one? Right. I can take that one too. So um, I would say no, I would say they're similar. Okay. Uh, the next one is our elderly also being affected by the increased incidence of clots, blood clots. Yeah, so the um, everyone is affected by the in increased incidence of blood clots. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, the probably higher in the elderly, if anything, because of the uh, increased amount of immobility in that in that age group. So immobility itself is a risk factor for blood clots. And so the less kind of active you are, particularly if you get ill, the higher the chance of developing a blood clot. Thank yeah, you very I'll much. Add, I'll, I'll add here one thing that um, we heard a lot early on, especially with the coronavirus uh, pandemic was, um, you know, I had people come to me and say, you know, I'm, I'm young and healthy and don't have other medical problems. I'm not worried about this virus. And yes, the more, there, there are higher uh, risk patients out there, certainly age, some of the things Dr. Varian mentioned, you know, diabetes, uh, pulmonary hypertension, coronary disease, heart failure, those can increase your risk of having major complications from the coronavirus. But some of these, especially some of these clotting issues that we've seen, uh, they occur in young, healthy patients um, and who don't have any comorbidities. And, and, and these, these uh, problems can be catastrophic. You know, you see how young and healthy Carolyn is. And she had pericarditis, you know, maybe some myocarditis. I mean, potentially serious complications of coronavirus. So I would just use this as, as an opportunity to remind everyone that, um, you know, even if you are potentially young and healthy, you can have serious consequences uh, from this virus. So everyone needs to be vigilant about this pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Dunn, very important. Next question that's coming through, are there different, more common COVID manifestations in different ages, age groups? So, um, you know, the, the, I would say that the relative incidence of symptoms is pretty consistent across all ages. It's just that as people age, it's much more likely that you will develop severe symptoms. So age is a clear risk factor uh, for severity of COVID. So the, the older people get, the more likely they are to get sick with COVID and, and honestly to die from COVID. So, um, but, but the actual incidence of individual symptoms, whether it's, you know, uh, neurologic problems or, or heart conditions or lung conditions is about similar across all those age groups. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. And this may have answered this next question as well. Is one age group more likely to become a long hauler? Uh, so to have some of these uh, long-term uh, effects from COVID, is, an age, is one of the age groups more likely to, to have uh, those, those experiences? You know, it's, it, that's a difficult question because we don't know much about that population because by definition, long hauler is, is many months after the infection. And, and as you all know, the really significant rise in infection, particularly in this part of the country, occurred primarily in, in, in November, December, January. So um, we're not really seeing those patients yet. So we have yet to, to kind of understand that. Um, the other thing is we're really teasing out how much of those residual symptoms are a direct result of the virus versus a just a result of being very, very sick. And so I think they're, they're probably different things, but there's a lot of people with persistent symptoms that would occur, say you had you know, some major operation and were in the hospital for a month, you may have similar symptoms. And we're still teasing out what is a direct result of the virus and what is a consequence of, of a prolonged illness. Yeah, and that's something that's important. Uh, you know, a, a COVID clinic, uh, like Dr. Brahman has described, is is helpful not only to be able to treat these patients long term and and follow them, but it helps us understand the process better. I mean, it helps us understand who is having potential uh, consequences of this long term, and then, you know, it allows us to kind of study um, long term what we're seeing. And the more we understand about it, then the more we're able to identify people and, and symptoms earlier on. So that's another reason why things like this COVID clinic where you concentrate all the patients in one place, you know, it allows us not only to, to treat, but also to, to research and understand. Thank you so much. 
The next question we have that's coming through, uh, you've mentioned the use of physical therapy, but what about occupational therapy? Uh, what do these rehab guidelines look like? And are you uh, looking to promote early mobilization with these therapies? Any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question, honestly. One of the difficulties we had very early in the virus is that, you know, uh, there's a fear of, of going into these patients' rooms. And not to mention, we had a shortage of protective equipment. So we had a number of uh, you know, things implemented to try to reduce how many people actually went into a, a patient with COVID's room. And one of the consequences of that that we saw is that people were just sitting in bed, even if they could walk around and talk and they just had to be in an isolated room by themselves and nobody would go in. So we did implement a number of uh, strategies to help with that. And, you know, early mobilization has definitely been proven to help in, in all ICU patients in general. Um, and in, in hospitalized patients, but, but we couldn't do it as well because we, we couldn't allow just anybody to go into the room and we we're trying to preserve protective equipment. So we actually have some protocols where um, the, the physical therapists and occupational therapists call into the room. We have video systems set up in the patient's room so they can do virtual you know, interactions with the patients. We got a whole bunch of these little uh, stationary bikes. They're basically like pedals set up and we give patients uh, these pedals so they can sit in a chair in their room and actually do a bike in their own room because they can't really walk around in the hallways because they got COVID. Um, so we've done some things like that um, and that's kind of the inpatient side. Now that the restrictions on kind of who goes in the room are being a little bit lightened because we have more protective equipment available, I would say we're getting back to more kind of normal physical therapy for our ICU and any of our COVID patients. Um, on the outpatient realm though, we're doing, you know, we are partnering with the rehab hospitals and, you know, they do a fantastic job about doing, you know, kind of in-house in physical therapy, occupational therapy for the sicker patients. But again, our, our rehab services have really uh, work to kind of come up with specialized treatment plans for patients who have had COVID. And so, yes, we have physical and occupational therapy available for those patients as an outpatient. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Melman. The next question for an athlete returning to sports after COVID-19, what is an appropriate assessment? Is the EKG sufficient and no symptoms? Justin or uh, Ken, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, it's a great question. Sure. And it's something that we're, and Ken, I want you to answer as well, but it's something we're still trying to tease out. You know, it, a lot of sports teams, uh, depending on how uh, professional versus, uh, you know, just local sports, they're all trying to come up with their own their own guidelines. I mean, um, early on when, when athletes were getting this and we saw some of these early studies showing these outrageously high um, incidences of myocarditis or inflammation of the heart muscle. Uh, you know, you send an athlete out with myocarditis to do rigorous sports and those, those uh, you know, that significantly increases their risk of, of sudden cardiac death. And so a lot of, uh, especially colleges uh, and professional sports teams really said, you need to see a cardiologist, you need to get an MRI before you come back in here and do sports. What we found is that if, if the athlete had, you know, no symptoms or maybe mild to moderate symptoms, Typically, they haven't had any long-term issues, long-term being relative, obviously. Patient, uh, athletes who got really sick, those are the ones that we are a little more aggressive about trying to screen before they come back and play sports. And there are guidelines being developed by the CDC and other organizations um, uh, to address this, but it's still a little bit nebulous. Ken, you want to you want to chime in there? Sure. Sure. So I agree with everything you said, um, um, and I don't really have a whole lot to add. I would say that if if a young athlete were to come to my office and say, you know, I had coronavirus, you know, the symptoms were mild, which is typical for a young uh, person. Uh, can I go back to um, playing? Uh, I feel fine. Uh, I would say go back to playing, and I wouldn't perform any testing at all. Um, the only way that I would do any testing is if the course was really complicated or if the patient continued to have symptoms. If the patient still has shortness of breath, of course, there's going to be. Uh, 
just can still hear me. Um, and um, th then I would probably get an EKG, an echocardiogram, maybe even a cardiac MRI. But an EKG alone as a screening tool to go back to um, play, I don't think is worthwhile. I will also add, you know, I have talked to our, in planning this clinic, we had a lot of conversations with our sports medicine and, and Dr. Schaub, our cardiologist, who's been working with many of the universities in the area, and they have very strict return to play guidelines. And so, you know, I would encourage if, if athletes have questions about that to, to go see those clinics because um, it depends on your symptoms. And the other thing that they're, they, they're stressing is, is not only the, the effects of COVID, but the effect of quarantining and inactivity and then returning to strenuous exercise in general. So there's a higher incidence of other injuries just because you laid around for two weeks. So if you're performing at a you know, college or professional level or even just a high level amateur athlete and then you stop running and then suddenly you go sprint again, you know, you're just as likely to injure another part of your body as to have a complication, probably more likely to injure something else rather than to have a specific consequence from COVID itself. But they, the sports medicine people really help to give you a, a plan to, to gradually return to exercise. Thank you so much. The next question, do the panelists expect current vaccines to offer some protection against heart-related issues for those that are vaccinated where the vaccine doesn't offer sterilizing immunity. Any comments on that? Yes. Go ahead, Kim. Sorry, I don't <laughs> No, that's all I would say is, is that, yes, the vaccine, if you've never had the disease and you get the vaccine, the vaccine's gonna prevent a bad illness and, uh, you know, uh, or work towards preventing a bad illness and reduce the chances of, of complications from occurring. So everybody should get vaccinated, unless you're a kid. Excellent. Thank you, doctor. They are starting a study in children uh, in, I think it's out of Oxford. And so we, we may have some information on that in the next year or so. But yeah, right now it was not studied in children. I would say the vaccine, the way that it was studied, if you get the vaccine, the way that it was studied in the vaccine trials, it looks like it is extremely, extremely effective in preventing illness from the coronavirus. Now, it doesn't always mean that you're not going to get the virus and be able to spread it to somebody else. That's still possible. So you need to be careful around people that are not vaccinated. Um, but in general, all the symptoms we talk about, especially the severe ones, uh, are almost entirely prevented by these, these vaccines. So we, we strongly encourage everyone to get them. Excellent. Thank you so much. Very, very important. Next question. After having COVID, should patients get a follow-up with their physicians, especially if they are a former cancer or heart disease patient? Yeah, so um, yeah, absolutely. Everybody who has COVID, you know, we encourage them to follow up at minimum with their primary care doctor. Um, the truth is though, is if you if your symptoms resolved. I mean, COVID can really, and, and the majority of the time, it actually acts like any other viral illness. And so it's, it's self, self limited. And so if you're asymptomatic, you definitely don't need to see a specialist or a COVID clinic or anything like that. But if there are persistent symptoms or concern that, you know, maybe it affected one of your other chronic conditions, I would definitely encourage people to follow up with their regular doctors. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question, I think this was just a follow-up to something that was discussed earlier. Um, they're asking, when you say really sick, are you referring to those who are hospitalized? Well, I don't know uh, if I said really sick or not, but I probably did several times, but um, you know, there's a gradient of illness for sure. And, and the gradient can be totally, you can have COVID and zero symptoms, so like the athletes or you know, people who have to get screened at work, and there's definitely that population. The other extreme is somebody who's on life support, for example, and there's every gradient in between. And so um, you know, a healthy person who gets really sick may, may be really sick at home. 
and I've certainly treated patients who are, you know, bordering on needing oxygen. I'm still giving treatment medications to, but they never come to the hospital. So that's that's really a gradient. And uh, um, but really sick, you know, I guess I'd mean in the, in the IC in the hospital in the ICU for the most part. Thank you very much for clarifying. So we are running a little tight on time and we got a few more questions. So we're gonna to try to squeeze in as many as we can before one o'clock. So regarding the COVID vaccine, should people pre-medicate prior to getting the, the vaccine with Tylenol or not? Will that slow down the immune response uh, to the protein? Is it safe to medicate for the symptoms after, after being vaccinated? Any comments on that? Do we know? I think the easy answer here is, or the, the simple answer is, we don't know uh, what effect these drugs have on it. it they weren't studied rigorously. Uh, there's a theoretical risk that if you take the, some kind of uh, suppressive therapy like Tylenol or, or Advil or something before your vaccine, it may have an impact. I think it's unlikely, but, um, and then same thing after. I, I think most people are recommending you don't take anything before you get the vaccine. And then if you're having significant symptoms, you know, 10, 12, 24 hours later, you know, it, it's probably okay to take some medications to, to alleviate your symptoms. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Dunn. Okay, so we're going to close out now. Any questions that we did not answer, we will try to get answers to those um, and send those out with our recap email. So I would like to, in closing, again, thank SUMA Health. Um, this community conversation is powered by support from SUMA Health, so thank you very much. And I would like to thank our panelists again for taking the time out of your busy schedules to bring your expertise to today's community conversation. And a big thank you to all of our healthcare teams across the region. We appreciate your tireless work and dedication to the health of our communities. I'd like to thank our listeners. Thank you all to the, for joining us here today. We will email resources discussed and we look forward to continuing the conversation as we plan future a community conversations with your needs in mind. Thank you again to everyone and stay well.